2019 was a terrible year for her. <laughs> yeah, he uh, he's now 95 and um, not as well as he used to be. Yeah. But, you know, he got his hip at 89. He's now 95. So he's had six years of relatively pain-free hip. Mm -hmm. and, that's a, and that's a huge difference, I think. It is. It's hard to be in pain all the time. Yeah. yeah. So age isn't really a factor for who I sign up for surgery. It isn't. No. Uh, I, I have done a hip replacement recently on a 23-year-old. Mm. Oh, wow. Uh, because he has juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. No. Oh. And then I have done a hip replacement in my train in my fellowship training on someone that was 92. So wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well just gotta have Sue. You just gotta have good discussions with these people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we're at 5:36. Let's just give it a couple more minutes. Hi, Jack. Hi, Sue. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, Carrie, I think you're, I think you're good to go. And I'll just keep admitting people. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar series. I'm going to do a quick introduction of Dr. Pate and then turn the wheels over, over to him to guide the rest of the presentation. Um, but before we do that, I just want to give a quick little introduction and what I have found most impressive about his background. But I'd also love for him to explain a little bit about his history. Um, he, he does specialize, Dr. Dr. Pete specializes in hip and knee replacements, painful joints, revision hip and knee replacements, and fracture care. Um, what I most appreciate, appreciate about his practice is his mission statement, which is, my goal is to provide quality care and more importantly, come to a joint decision on how to improve quality of life. Whether it's being able to walk and live with less pain or be able to get back on the golf course or pickleball court like you once did. Being born and raised in Hawaii, I know the benefits and desire to be outside and active as much as possible. Living in Colorado has only solidified this as we're able to enjoy the outdoors and amazing seasons this place has to offer. And I truly appreciate that statement because our residents at Balfour are incredibly active and want to remain so and we try and embrace that and encourage that lifestyle as much as possible so we are all very excited to hear this presentation dr pate and i thank you for joining us today and i will turn it over to you from here awesome thank you um thank you for having me and thank you for setting this up uh, you guys have been by far the most easiest and best people to work with that i've done a presentation for so <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, I guess you touched on my history a little bit and um, I, I really can't agree more. And that's really how I run my practice in trying to come up with a game plan for patients. Um, I think hip and knee replacement is an elective procedure for that reason, um, because I think it's ultimately the patient's choice on whether or not they should get a hip or knee replacement. And so, I do my best to try to present um, the information as best as I can. Uh, I think it works great that I work for a university so I can present kind of the, the literature and evidence-based side of things as best as I can to the patient and then ultimately come to a joint decision. So um, like you were saying, born and raised in Hawaii. Uh, I went to undergrad in California at UC Irvine where I played baseball. Um, and then I went back home for medical school in Hawaii, 
then traveled all the way to Akron, Ohio, which was a little different. First time living in snow for my residency. And then um, did 180 and went to Phoenix, Arizona, where I've never experienced 120 degree summers and did my fellowship there and then uh, moved to Colorado uh, to start practice. So I am gonna share my screen here and then we can start the presentation. So I'm gonna talk about osteoarthritis management. Um, most of it deals with hip and knee, and that's because I specialize in that, but um, really arthritis affects every part of your body and every joint. So uh, really relevant overall for everything in terms of orthopedics, by far the, one of the more common things we see in orthopedics. So I have no disclosures to discuss. Um, these are some of the golf courses that I've gotten to play at over the years. Um, the two top pictures are in Arizona, the, the middle one uh, being in Ohio. Uh, never saw leaves change colors before till I moved there. Um, obviously in Hawaii, there's one season and that's pretty much summer all year around, 80 degrees and sunny with some rain. So that was a pretty uh, awesome thing to see. This is my two and a half year old kid and I, I have this because obviously he loves dancing. And so, you know, the title of my, my presentation is getting back to the golf course and dance floor. He loves dancing. I wish we could all uh, get back to this level of being so flexible and healing from injuries like none other, but obviously we can't do that. So, uh, you know, that's why I have a job and that's why uh, I have this presentation to talk to people about how to get back to an active lifestyle in a way that we can do as we get older. So objectives of this talk is to talk about what, what is arthritis, um, identify some risk factors, um, more importantly, look at some images, and then obviously discuss both the conservative treatment algorithm and the surgical treatment. Um, I think it's very important for any orthopedic surgeon to, to show people their images. Um, we basically live off of x-ray images. Uh, we, we look at bones all the time. And so without x-ray, we wouldn't be able to fully see what's going on. And I think it's important to teach and show your patient um, the, the x-rays that we're looking at. So, so what is arthritis? So basically it's a degenerative disease of the joints and that causes progressive loss uh, of something called articular cartilage. So um, everyone always asks, what is articular cartilage? So it's a smooth white tissue that covers the ends of our bones. This is what allows our joints uh, to move friction mess. So as you bend your knee, you bend your finger, um, it, it moves and glides smoothly because of this articular cartilage. So <clears throat> in my office, I use this example every single time and I don't actually know how many people look at the end of their chicken bone that they eat, but that's the picture on the left. Um, that's every time I see that, I tell my wife, look, it's what I look at every day. And so um, that's the perfect example that I use, but on the right is what your knee cartilage actually looks like. And you can tell it looks very, very similar to the cartilage in chicken bones. And that's that smooth white uh, covering that allows the frictionless movement in in any of your joints. So then you should ask yourself, why should you even be concerned? Um, again, like I talked about, arthritis is the most common form, osteoarthritis is the most common form of arthritis. It's also one of the most prevalent musculoskeletal conditions that we see worldwide. Over 240 million people worldwide and 50 million in, in the US are affected by it. And as you can see, about 88 per 100,000 are affected symptomatically um, for hip arthritis and 240 per 100,000 for knee arthritis. So by far most common is knee arthritis. And I see that in my office, I probably sign up two knee replacements for every hip replacement that I sign up. So 
And then on top of that, 43% um, of this 54 million have some type of uh, limitations in their daily activity due to their arthritis. And then if you add on wages loss, that's up to 65 billion. And then direct medical costs, that's seeing someone like me in the office, getting injections, um, and then eventually surgery. All these things add up to exceed over $100 billion. And the average person with knee arthritis will typically spend about $15,000 on medical costs over their lifetime. So that is a pretty significant amount of money. And that's uh, one reason why we as physicians um, continue to do research on one, ways to prevent arthritis, and then two, more importantly, ways to treat arthritis, because uh, as we'll talk about, there's very limited treatment, uh, especially to try and reverse arthritis. So this is a very uh, kind of shocking figure, really, about how many knee replacements and hip replacements there are going to be uh, in the future. So this, this study was done in 2007, so it was, it's been a while, but, um, and, and, and in fact, we're actually getting close to the end of their projection, which was 2030, but you can see that uh, in 2005, and this is the annual number of procedures times 1,000, so, so knees, knee replacements done back in 2005 were 500,000 total knee replacements. And by 2030, they're expected to jump all the way to 3,500 times 1,000. So that's a, a, a ton of knee replacements. And that is mostly because of this baby boomer population getting to the age now where they're going to start experiencing arthritis. Um, but clearly, clearly, clearly a, a distressing sign. For one, not only that we don't have enough orthopedic surgeons to take care of this, but the uh, healthcare burden that uh, arthritis will place uh, on the overall system. So what kind of symptoms do most people have with arthritis? By far, the most common things that I see are the top two, which is pain and stiffness. Um, and, and funny thing is, the patients always come in saying, oh, my knee feels really great today, but two weeks ago, it was the worst pain that I've ever felt in my life. And, and that's kind of what arthritis does. It waxes and wanes. And so one day you may feel like, you know, I don't even have any problem with my knee. The next day you go out and walk, walk around your block or walk a mile and you feel absolutely terrible. Um, unfortunately, we don't know why that happens. Um, but we do know that is a hallmark sign of arthritis, so that waxing and waning pain. And then stiffness, you know, as your arthritis tends to get worse and worse, you just start to move your, your joint less and less, and so therefore you get um, some stiffness in that joint. Tenderness, obviously, if you are having pain, if you put some pressure over that area, uh, you'll, ten you'll tend to feel uh, pain over where you're pressing. And then Again, with stiffness, the loss of flexibility. This grating sensation. So um, a lot of people say when they're going up and down stairs or bending, uh, they're, they feel like this, this kind of catching and grating over their kneecap. Uh, that is very common. Uh, as that smooth cartilage kind of gets roughed up, you can imagine that as those roughed up areas come into contact with each other, they get this they give you this grating sensation. Bone spurs is a very common thing that people know about. Uh, our body is unfortunately not smart enough to know that as your arthritis gets worse, uh, and especially when we talk about this bone on bone arthritis, our body's response to that, unfortunately, anytime it sees stress is to create more bone. And so as you get more bone on bone arthritis, your body thinks I need to heal myself, makes these extra bone spurs, and that's why these form on x ray. And then swelling, again, very similar to pain, waxes and wanes. So you can feel and have absolutely no swelling one day, and then a week later, your knee is swollen like a big balloon. Um, so, all these things very common. So, what are the risk factors? Obviously, older age. Uh, we used to think that arthritis was just a disease of um, 
wear and tear. And so we figured, you know, as you get older, it's, it's common. You're going to get some arthritis because you have now kind of wore your, your joint down to, to what it is now. Um, we now know that there's a lot more in play than that. Mostly we have now started looking at genetics, but by far, obviously, you know, as you get older, you have put more stress on your joints and therefore uh, much more likely to get arthritis. Interestingly enough, uh, one study found that uh, females are a lot more uh, likely to get arthritis than males. Uh, and that's a pretty significant amount, 18.7% versus 13.5. Uh, obesity, unfortunately, uh, as all of America uh, knows, uh, we have slowly increased our BMIs and uh, weight uh, over the years. Um, you know, it is kind of what it is, but I tell patients and I try to tell them for every 10 pounds that you have on extra, it's probably like putting 10 times the amount of force on your knee or hip joint. Um, and you can imagine uh, someone weighing three, 400 pounds, the amount of pressure they're actually putting on their joints is very significant. So um, previous joint injuries, it is not uncommon for me to see these in my office uh, 10, 15 years down the line. These are, you know, old football players that had an ACL injury or had this knee scope done and had, you know, they think something done with their meniscus. And we know that anytime you have these surgeries done on your knee or injuries to your knee, this likely starts a cascade of getting arthritis slightly sooner than the, the normal person. So this accounts up to about 12% of knee arthritis that we see. And along with that repeated stress on the joint. So, you know, again, what we used to think was wear and tear, it's probably a little bit true. So if you are in a job or play a sport that constantly put stresses on your knee, then you, we know that you'll probably get arthritis sooner than the normal person. And then, like I talked about, this is probably the newest and hottest topic is genetics. Uh, so now it's uh, much more easier for us to blame our parents or our grandparents and say, yep, I have this terrible knee or hip because my grandma had a hip replacement when she was 60 and now I'm needing to get a hip replacement as well. Um, and then uh, certain metabolic diseases. So this is relatively recent as well. High triglycerides, high blood pressure and elevated blood sugar, so diabetes. And this likely has to do with overall general health and again, weight issues and kind of how much we use our joints more than the actual metabolic disease that's causing arthritis. So this is a diagram of exactly what happens in arthritis. So I'll try to use my cursor here, but on the left side here is a pristine, perfect knee. You can think of this as like an 18 year old person's knee. That blue slash purple color is the articular cartilage, cartilage that looks nice and smooth. Um, that's how I wish every knee that I saw looked like. Unfortunately, it's not. And fortunately, it's the reason why I have a job and can do surgery. But uh, you can see on the picture on the right, that cartilage gets worn down. And so what I tell people is it's kind of like uh, the treads on your tire, on your car. Uh, as, as you put you know, more and more miles on your car, you're gonna start to wear down that tread. And it's the same thing with articular cartilage. You, know, you, you put more and more stress on your joint. You have a previous surgery uh, that takes away some of the meniscus which is kind of like the shock absorbers in your car, you're gonna put more force and stress on your articular cartilage and wear it down. And then you get this, so what's underneath the articular cartilage is the bone. And that's why when we say you have bone on bone arthritis, this is exactly what we mean is because now there's exposed bone underneath your cartilage and it's now touching. So this is the end of your thigh bone. It's now touching the top of your shin bone where there's also bone exposed. Um, so that is the main reason why you get the pain is because there's bone on bone grinding now. Uh, we now know that there's probably slightly more which shows up in this model or diagram and that's because we get this huge inflammatory response due to the arthritis. So 
as your bone starts to grind against bone, you can see that red forming along that bone. That's a significant amount of inflammation in your bone. That inflammation then uh, gets into your entire knee joint. The soft tissue that's inside of your knee joint gets inflamed, uh, including there's some fat in your knee. Uh, there's some other soft tissue, ligamentous and uh, meniscal structures and everything in your knee basically gets inflamed. And that's what causes the significant amount of pain that you experience. And so again, this is probably the reason why it waxes and wanes. You know, you, you can have one week where you have all this inflammation in your knee and then you rest, uh, you know, you don't do as much activity. That inflammation, you know, our body is smart enough to to heal itself as best as it can. So it does heal itself. The inflammatory molecules and cells eventually leave the knee because it healed it to, to its best ability. And that's why your knee probably feels better at the end. So this is kind of where uh, I start my discussion with patients first by looking at their x-ray. And so I always try to pull up a normal x-ray for them to show the difference. Um, I've looked at a million x-rays. My patient probably has never seen an x-ray in their life. So I start off with their, a normal knee x-ray, which is on the left here. You can see this is the end of the thigh bone coming down and then the top of the shin bone coming up. And for me, what I look at is this nice big black space between the two bones there. You can see that nice and clear. That's the articular cartilage, that smooth white substance that you can't see on x-ray. When we take an x-ray, all that picks up is bone, but the articular cartilage is there at the end of the bone. Think of it as like a cap at the end of the bone. And that's what makes this nice big space between the two bones. And then as you can see on the two pictures on the right, that as your cartilage gets worn down, that space disappears. And so this is again, what we call bone on bone arthritis because that articular cartilage is now gone and therefore not making any space on the x-ray. Um, and so this is what I would consider pretty severe arthritis uh, on x-ray. <clears throat> a lot of people come to my office with MRIs, even though they have bad, bad arthritis, this is not uncommon to see kind of these two pictures of an MRI. This is looking at it straight on, looking at your knee straight on on the left and looking at it from the side on the right you can see this white uh, kind of matter through the bone on both the end of the thigh bone and top of the shin bone. And that's, whenever we see white on an MRI, that's fluid. And that fluid is because of inflammation and swelling and edema um, because there's bone on bone contact there. So you can see why people have so much pain is because not only is it just grinding bone on bone in that one spot, but that swelling and inflammation kind of expands all the way up through the bone there, um, causing significant pain. And then the picture on the right is showing what your meniscus looks inside your knee. Uh, again, the meniscus lives inside of that big space between your two knees. So if you lose that space, the meniscus has nowhere to go but get kind of squished in between the two bones and tear. So this is a very common MRI that we see. And then this, this is a, a normal hip x-ray. Um, I'm going to do my best here to hopefully let you guys see. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but the outline of the ball uh, through there and then the outline of the socket is right above it. But there's a nice clear space between the two of them there. Um, so this is what a normal hip x-ray looks like. And then as you start to get worse and worse arthritis, you can see that that space between the ball outline and the socket outline basically disappears. And then the far picture on the right is a perfect example of what we call a bone spur, which is this little horn sticking out. Um, again, as you're starting to grind more bone on bone, your body thinks I need to heal myself. So they make a little more bone and that's what that bone spur uh, is. So treatment options, <clears throat> conservative treatments is what I always, always start off with. Uh, I love doing surgery, but I would hate it if I went directly into surgery with a patient and they hated their treatment <coughs> without first trying some conservative measures. So um, these are all the things that I talk about in my office, uh, activity modification, weight loss, if it's appropriate, anti-inflammatories, topical ointments, bracing and physical therapy. 
So uh, anti-inflammatories is probably first line treatment for me. That's anything that you can think of, ibuprofen, Aleve, uh, naproxen, some people take meloxicam um, and things like that. So very common. Uh, I do counsel patients about some GI side effects, uh, upset tummy, um, nausea, uh, if they ever had a history of any bleeds in their stomachs, definitely not take this. And then it does also get cleared by your kidneys. So if you have any kidney issues, then you should probably not take this as well. Topical ointments, uh, Voltaren gel is usually my first go-to for this uh, type of treatment. It's a topical anti-inflammatory. Used to be only prescribed, but now it's over the counter at any drugstore. And then knee braces. Um, so for all these treatments, I tell patients, you know, you have to almost try everything and see what works best for you because uh, you know, what could work best for one person is absolutely terrible and worse, makes their knee or hip worse off for another person. So um, unfortunately, it's not a one size fit all and one cure uh, help all. So you really have to try almost everything to see what works best for you. These, these two next two slides are kind of, uh, we have different organizations and um, academies uh, and societies that we're a part of, and they send out recommendations every year. Um, this third column is probably the most uh, common recommendation or society we uh, attend to. It's the overall United States Academy of Orthopedic Surgery. And so, as you can see, uh, weight loss, uh, education programs about exercise and medication and actual physical exercise are all strongly recommended, with, which is the green dots uh, for knee arthritis. And then as you get into actual drug treatments, anti-inflammatories like the ibuprofen, Aleve, topical NSAIDs, which is the Voltaren gel, and um, tramadol, which is actually a synthetic narcotic, is recommended uh, for knee arthritis. Um, I have a lot of patients that talk to me about glucosamine. Um, it is, I think, a, you know, our academy recommends against it, but I tell patients it's relatively cheap and there's not very many side effects. So again, I tell patients to try everything they can. Um, so I actually am okay with people trying that. And then for me personally in office, these are the two things that I can help them with the two type of injections that I do in office. One, steroid injections, also known as Kenalog or Triamcinolone, um, and then gel injections. A lot of people know these as rooster comb injections. The main component of it is hyaluronic acid injections. So um, by far, I, the probably one of the more common things I do in office is injecting knees and hips. Um, I always start off with a steroid injection and this you know, someone's allergic to it. Uh, one, because it has a pretty good result. And two, uh, these gel injections oftentimes, well, they do have to get approved by your insurance first before we proceed with them. And they oftentimes want to see you have tried a steroid injection first. So start off with a steroid injection. If that doesn't work, then we move on to the gel injections uh, next. What exactly are these injections doing? Yeah, great question. Um, so, so steroid injections work solely as if you remember my slide about kind of the inflammation in the knee. Steroids are the strongest anti-inflammatory that we have in medicine. It basically is injected directly into the joint that is painful to get rid of the inflammation. Gel injections, on the other hand, work a little differently. Uh, I tell people kind of the history behind gel injections, the the reason why everyone knows it as rooster comb injections is because initially, and I'm not sure who, someone was brave enough to break a rooster comb and found some fluid that came out of it and decided to inject that into somebody's knee. And that person's knee felt a whole lot better with that. We now make these in the lab, so we're not killing off rooster combs. <laughs> but we think, uh, initially it was thought that this is just providing some cushion per se into the knee. But now we think, or now we know more about kind of the fluid makeup in, in joints, more specifically knees. 
So they look at an 18 year old person's knee and know that there's a lot of proteins and nutrients in this knee. As you get older and get arthritis, those proteins and nutrients are, are kind of lost and in exchange, it becomes more watery. So we all have fluid in our knee. This fluid in arthritic knee becomes more watery. So the idea is that you're injecting this synthetic fluid that more looks like an 18 year old person's knee. And so therefore you get the proteins and nutrients that you need to help with pain. Um, still not 100% sure, but it works. I tell patients, a steroid injection will probably be 50-50 if it works for you. A gel injection, probably about 70% chance. So, so these are kind of how injections are done in the office. Uh, the knee is an easy uh, joint to inject. It's very superficial. You can feel where the space is between the two bones. A hip, unfortunately, is a very deep joint. So you need some type of imaging, either an ultrasound or in this case, the x-ray shows. Uh, first, what they do is stick the needle in, get an x-ray, squirt a little bit of dye, as you can see, that black mark there. Um, once they see that dye filling up the hip joint, then they squirt the medicine in there. So that one requires a little more imaging. And then lastly, of course, surgical treatment. Um, so full knee replacement, partial knee replacement, and total hip replacement. So this is a picture of a full knee replacement an x-ray of a full knee replacement. So after you're all done, you can see what I tell patients is basically like taking out the parts where you should have articular cartilage and replacing that cap with a metal cap on both sides of the bone. And then now you can see there's a space uh, on this x-ray between the two metal pieces. And that's because there's a plastic piece that goes in between those two metal pieces. And so now it's metal on plastic. And so that's what helps your new knee glide smoothly. But basically we restore the same idea, which is there's space now between the two uh, bones, but now metal, so. So partial knee replacement is a relatively more new thing. It's been around now for about probably 15 years. Um, this is the idea that if you only have arthritis on the inside portion of your knee, like this picture x-ray shows, then you can only replace that one part of the knee. Um, then you leave the rest of the knee alone. The benefits of this procedure is it's a lot quicker, a lot quicker recovery, much smaller procedure. And you actually keep all the ligaments inside of your knee that are there um, instead of taking it out with a, um, with a full knee replacement. So I love doing these when I can. Unfortunately, it requires a very specific patient to have a specific x-ray. And so for this instance, they need to have uh, arthritis only on that inside part of the knee. And that's exactly where their pain needs to be um, to get this surgery. And then lastly, hip replacement, by far the most, uh, probably the best surgery that we have in orthopedics and which is why I love doing these because patients absolutely love them. So you basically cut out the ball that's um, hitting against the cup or grinding against the cup and you replace it with a new ball that has a stem going down part of the thigh bone and then you replace the cup with some metal um, and then inside the cup there's a plastic piece for the new ball to um, articulate against. So why do we do these? Uh, because patients do amazing with them. Uh, like I just said, hip, hip replacements is probably the best surgery we have in orthopedics. Over 96% of patients report satisfaction after one year of hip replacement. In my office, I typically see hip replacement patients are almost back to everything that they wanna do in about one to two months. So it is a very quick turnaround and you will see a hip replacement go from night to day uh, after their surgery. Um, they feel terrible and then you do their surgery a month or two after they actually recover from their surgery, they are thanking you like no other. So I think it's a great surgery. Um, quality of life and significantly improved improvement in all four different function questionnaires. So basically um, functionally patients have significant improvement. Knee replacement, on the other hand, this is why I tell knee replacement candidates 
or knee arthritis patients, let's try everything we can first before we actually do a knee replacement. And that's because this, the patient satisfaction with this ranges from anywhere from 80 to 92%. So a lot less than the hip replacements, still great, but a lot less. And so that's why I tell these patients to try everything they can first before we proceed with a knee replacement. So that's all I have. I will leave it open to questions. And thank you again for having me. Yeah, thank you. If you just wanna uh, unmute yourself folks and ask questions, that'd be great. Or if you're too shy, put it in the chat and I'll, I'll read it off to you. So here's one question in the chat, doctor says, what percentage of partial replacements are you doing compared to full? Yeah, great question. So um, again, it, I think it takes a very specific patient and our literature would suggest that you should probably be doing partial knee replacements about five to 10% of the time. So out of all your replacements should be about five to 10% of your surgeries. And that's honestly kind of what I do. Um, for every maybe 50 or so, 25 to 50 full knee replacements, I have one partial knee replacement. Any other questions, Melanie or Lynn? Um, when you're not arthritic yet, but you have activities like backpacking where you're carrying 25 pounds in and out um, or you hike a lot and are putting extra wear and tear on those joints. Are there anything, is there anything you can do preventatively? Does food make a difference? Are we just looking at better treatments in the next 20 years when I might need them? <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's a good question. In fact, <laughs> uh, in fact, I love running and I'm, I don't think I'm, I'll give up running for a long time. And I tell my patients actually that running is probably the worst thing that you can do. If you could go swimming or exercise in a pool, that'd be awesome. Next best thing is biking. So I don't listen to my own advice, but I actually read an article that said that runners have a decreased incidence of arthritis. So again, we don't know enough. It could be that you, your cartilage does need to see some stress. Um, everything in our body, gets turned over. I use skin as an example, you know, we shed our skin constantly. Um, so with our bones and with our cartilage, it does need to see some stress in order for it to wanna turn over. So I think exercise, and that's why we recommend exercise is because it's probably good for you. And so I, I don't think that you hiking and backpacking is doing damage to yourself. In fact, I think it's probably a little more protective than anything. Okay, that's good to know. Um, do you also do smaller joint replacements like toe joints and things like that? Uh, I don't personally do them. I have partners who, you know, specialize in foot and ankle. Um, there is, there are, there are replacements for ankles, shoulders. There's questionable data about whether you should do uh, finger joint replacements um, and toe replacements. Oh, interesting. Okay. Is there, um, is there any effect of um, altitude on uh, joint, joint pain? Yeah. Tell me I need to move back to Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. I don't, think, I don't think it has anything to do with joint pain, um, but I will tell you that uh, my patients here in higher altitude are increased risk for complications after surgery for a joint replacement mm -hmm. and more specifically blood clots. And in fact, mm -hmm. the CU School of Medicine has researched that and put it out there that uh, being at altitude does put you at increased risk of uh, getting a blood clot after surgery. Mm -hmm. That's wild. Yeah. Do the gel I, injections, I'm sorry, I thought you were finished. No, I apologize. I think it's probably be because um, when I first moved here, I, I went running and I ran a mile in like 10 minutes when my usual is seven and I was dying. And so I think you create more hemoglobin or like those red blood cells to try to carry oxygen. Mm -hmm. And so your blood is probably actually thicker, um, which leads you to probably get increased risk of clots. Gotcha. Thank you.
Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, the gel treatment, is that um, the gel injections, is that common, commonly it, used for multiple types of joints? It is, it is commonly used. By far, it's most common in the knee. Uh, I will tell you that the FDA only approves it for the knee. That being said, some orthopedic surgeons use it in other joints. Um, but if something bad happens, if you say inject it into an ankle, then and the patient sues you for it, the FDA, you know, you're going to be at a, in big trouble because the FDA only approves it for knees. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I know it doesn't make it doesn't make sense in in other parts of the world, uh, Europe. We use Europe a lot because they're kind of like very close relative to us. They let you inject it into any joint. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, so data on effectiveness is coming out of Europe. Um, and 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 the U.S. too, but for the U.S., it's only out of, out of knees. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Are there any other questions for Dr. Pate? I have one, one quick question. Go for it. Oftentimes, and I experience this with my mother as well, but also with our residents, we have with hip surgeries, there's one, one side that's worse than the other, but both need surgery at some point. Do yeah. you recommend staggering those surgeries or how, how is that best to handle? Yeah, great question. Um, I, I recommend staggering them uh, for recovery purposes. You can imagine that after you do one hip or knee, you tend to rely on the other leg a lot more uh, just because it's so painful to put. It's not that you can't put weight on that leg. It's just painful to do so. And so I, I tell patients to try to do one at a time. I have a handful of patients that you know, say, well, I'm just gonna go find another surgeon then. And so I say, look, I, I wanna take care of you. I, and so I'll do it at the same time, but I try to advise him against it. And unfortunately I use one of my patients as a prime example. He did both knees at the same time and he doesn't bend his knees very well. And again, I think that's pain related if you do both at the same time, he was so painful that he doesn't, he didn't rehab as well. Um, and so, yeah, no, I, a, I, a, I do make some exceptions. I have a guy that is a, he, he does yard maintenance during the summer and then snow plowing and takes care of snow during the winter. It's how he makes his living. You know, I tell patients, you probably need to be off of work for at least a couple months. So, you know, if I stagger him, he's gonna be out of work for four months. And that's just a little too much for him. That kind of leads into a question that was in the chat. What 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 does recovery time look like for knee replacements? Yeah, so so um, for knees, I tell patients that you're on a walker anywhere from two to six weeks after surgery, and then full recovery, getting back to everything that you want to do, uh, anywhere from two to four months. So that's a pretty lengthy recovery for hips. I tell patients you should probably be off a walker more at four weeks anywhere from two to four weeks, and then full recovery more like one to three months, so. Why is the knee so hard to recover? Yeah, uh, I think we just don't know enough about the knee joint yet. Mm -hmm. uh, for us in orthopedics, we, we just call it a hinge joint, you know, like it just bends straight back and, but really it does more than that because if we step on uneven surface, your knee has to accommodate for that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it has a lot more movement than just bending and extending. And so our knee replacement probably doesn't perfectly get that balance back yet. Gotcha. It does seem like every year there's some, or maybe every 10, there's new advancements in. I mean, just even from when I was in school, like they're just amazing how, how much things have progressed. So that's- For sure. Um, I, in fact, I tell my patients now, a lot of them, you know, they had one hip replacement done 10 years ago and they say, so this new hip should last like what, 10, 15 years. I tell them, no, our, our technology is a lot better now. I, I tell patients 20 to 25 years that it should last you for. Um, I did, where I did my training, we used all robotics to do surgery. And so the advancement 
in this technology is is un unbelievable. Um, and I think that's great for the patient, really. That's great. Okay. Well, any other questions before we wrap it up? Carrie, any parting words for the guests and for Dr. Pate? Uh, no, I just like to say thank you to Dr. Pate and would like to just give give a little local plug to to this physician. He's a local um, doctor here in our area and also practices a lot in Longmont. Um, so we appreciate being local partners. And thank you so much for your presentation today, Dr. Pate. Yeah, thank you for having me. And um, I, if anyone ever has questions or wants to talk with me, um, Louise, you can feel free to give them my email. Sure will. Um, I do have office in Broomfield as well as in Longmont. Um, I love being far away from the Anschutz campus because I hate driving in traffic <laughs> and I hate trying to find parking there. Um, and I live in Thornton, so it's much, much nicer being kind of in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I love everything about where I'm at. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll be sure to share your contact information with everybody. And we've recorded this so that we can play it back to uh, our residents as well and share it with them. We throw it up on YouTube. That way people can listen to it at their own leisure. And, and, uh, and then we'll probably add a slide at the end that uh, has your contact information. So awesome. Great. Thank you. Thank right. you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Have a good night. Aloha. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thanks, Dr. Pate. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> Enjoyed your presentation. Thanks.